unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Our reading tonight comes from Ezekiel, the 36th chapter. Ezekiel, uh, the 36th chapter. It begins with the first verse. When God appeals to the prophet Ezekiel, to prophesy unto the mountains of Israel and say, Ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. The second verse says, Thus saith the Lord God, Because the enemy has said against you, Ah, even the ancient high places are ours in possession. The Bible says, Therefore prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Because they have made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side, that you might be a possession unto the residue of the heathen, and you have taken up in the lips of talkers and an infamy of the people. Therefore, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. That saith the Lord God to the mountains, and to the hills, and to the rivers, and to the valleys, and to the desolate wests, to the cities that are forsaken, which became a prey and derision, to the residue of the heathen that are round about you. Therefore, that saith the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen, and against all the Dumea which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart, with a despiteful mind, to cast it out for a prey. I'll explain what this is. If you read the chapters before, Ezekiel lives in a time where Israel has rebelled against God. They have done things against God. And because of that, many things have befallen them in a time period that even their enemies are rejoicing over them. They are doing quite a lot against them. And if you read even earlier, the Edomian, the Edomites, in fact, scripturally, when we talk about the Edomite, the Bible talks of the Edomite or the sons of Esau as an enemy or force against the children of Israel. They had not only ridiculed the children of Israel, but taken over many things. Because the children of Israel at that particular point had fallen before God. And many judgments were surrounding them. And so, as scripture would have it, when you read from the second verse, the Bible says, Because the enemy has said against you, are even the ancient high places are ours for a position. These are the things that star God to tell the prophet Ezekiel to prophesy for the sake of the redemption of the children of Israel. And we see, yes, they have fallen. They've done all these kinds of things. In fact, if you go down to the 16th verse, the Bible speaks of the things that they have done. Uh, he says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, When the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. These are the things Israel did. Their way was before me as the uncleanliness of a removed woman. Wherefore, I poured out my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed among the countries according to their way and according to their doings. I judged them, and when they entered unto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name when they say to them that these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. But the Bible says again, but I had pity of my own holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen whither they went. So we see that they had done quite a lot. And God likens to the impurity of their sin as a woman, you know, that was in her days. It was so bad to God. Okay. So the Bible tells us because of that, they're scattered. And... They are judged by the wrath of God. So God hands them over into the hands of their enemies and he just, you know, lets quite a lot happen. But even when God lets Israel over to the judgment of their enemies, there is a place in God that would not allow the enemy to go further than certain boundaries. And this was it. So when we go to the second verse and we're discussing the places of how the enemy, uh, the Edomites, who of course have an inheritance with Mount Seir, 
are boasting over the children of Israel that were taken over the ancient high places, your places uh, of worship, your places of covenant, and now ours for a position. This is the thing that stirs God to come in. Because even when a man has fallen flat before God, in sin, with iniquity, there are things wherewith if God sees your enemy try to take over, he will put a limitation to tell him that it doesn't matter what is happening to this individual. I cannot let you go beyond certain things. And for the mountains and high places that are spoken of in the second verse was Zion, their inheritance. God is saying, regardless of how fallen my children are, I cannot let the devil take what I gave them for an inheritance. The Edomites busted because of the weakness of Israel. They defeated them on all fronts. And they thought that for a moment, they could take over the inheritance of Israel. And God is saying, anything could happen to these fellows. I could let them in your hands for a punishment. I could abandon them for you to deal with them as you will. But what I cannot do is to let you step into their inheritance. When it comes to inheritance, it is underguarded. It is protected jealously by God. That regardless of how fallen you are or how you could fall, if you are under a certain covenant, he would not let anything get to the inheritance that he has arrayed for you. Why? Because there is a space and heart in him for your redemption eventually. There's a place in God at a particular point that expects that things will change in your heart. He will devise means for your deliverance. And that after your deliverance, what are you left to? That at least you'll find that your inheritance was kept, it was sanctified, it was stored up for you. That is why the psalmist says that the Lord maintains my lot. He maintaineth my lot. Now, when the children of Israel fall before God, who we see by reason of love, he has pity. God is teaching us something. Because when he hands them over, we think, why are they handed over to the enemy? And what is the enemy going to do with them? Of course we know destruction is going to come. Of course we know tumult is going to come. Of course we know sicknesses are going to come. Of course we know attacks, poverty, sickness, and all these other things are going to happen when a man is handed over to the enemy. But I've learned by God that if a man is under a particular covenant with God, the language of God to his own is chastisement and not condemnation. And that is why we see at the end of this conversation that even when God was a wrath with these people, he was annoyed with them. He was hurt because of their weakness. The Bible says he was always moved to pity. He was always moved to pity. He was always moved to his own with love. And he's saying... I'm not exposing them over into judgment because I want their destruction and the end of their destruction. No, I'm doing that as a God with love, accepting a certain chastisement for them because my heart as God is for their redemption. More so when you become a New Testament believer, when you become born again. And the Bible says in the book of Romans, uh, the 8th chapter, that there's now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. Whatever you will suffer for your weakness can only be a space of chastisement for your restoration. God does not intend that any man perish. God does not intend that through your foolishness you would lose your inheritance. These are things that he will undergird because there is a hope, an expectation in the heart of the Father that one day you will be restored and when you are restored, you'll be restored into what he has already ordained for you. The plans he has for you are to make you prosper, not to harm you, to give you a future and hope. That expected end, and your end is of the Lord. He knows that regardless of whatever you go through, whatever weaknesses that you'll have, whatever messing up is in your life, there's going to come a time where you'll reconcile yourself. He will let all manner of things happen for your chastisement. But remember, the Bible says he chastises those he loves. Wherever love is, the scourging can only be for the restoration, for the reconciliation, for the redemption of mankind. That's the way of the Spirit. That's the way of love. That's the mind of God. There are people who have made terrible mistakes. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If God was the kind of God 
to unveil our weaknesses, to expose our shortcomings, to reveal the meditations of our minds and heart. I don't know whether any man would be trusted with anything in the world. But the Bible says he knows what is in men. That is why the Christ did not commit himself to them. The Bible says he knew what was in man. He knew what was in man. Even our righteousness is filthy rags. And in this walk of salvation, you will err. You will err. If you have not, you will err in the flesh. Why? Because there's a process that perfects you in the maturity of the things of the Spirit. We're not all born again at the same level of understanding concerning the things of the Spirit. God deals with us in his own way, at his own time. And slowly by slowly as he's dealing with us, we learn and unlearn. And some of us are more rebellious than others. Some of us are more stubborn than others. And because of that, in the church, we have imported the wrath of men. And we have placed it on the altar with the impression that it's actually the wrath of God. We have brought or imported the patience of men. And we've presented it on the altars as the patience of God. And because men have run out of patience with you, or people have run out of patience with your character, we tend to assume that God has run out of patience with you. God is love. And his love for you is unconditional. But while you're on that walk, you find yourself in a challenge. You've made a mistake. You did not fulfill a particular principle. You did things the wrong way. You went the wrong path. It couldn't happen. It has happened and will happen. There's an assurance that you should ever keep and should guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That regardless of how far the enemy would ever come against you, God will never let over your inheritance. He's so jealous about the things that you are and have in him. The Bible says we've begotten to an inheritance amongst the saints in the light. It's incorruptible. It's imperishable. It does not fade away. That inheritance is available for you. In other words, he will never take away what you are in Christ. Everything that you have been given in Christ. What is available for your taking in Christ. Those things are constant, even to the most fallen Christian. To the most wayward believer, those things will stay constant. Why? Because at the point of reconciliation and restoration, your redemption, when God has chastised you, dealt with you, in fact, the word chastisement there is translated disciplined into receiving the things that are ordained for you. That's chastisement. Chastisement is a place where God disciplines you to receive. He disciplines your spirit to receive. He disciplines your soul. He disciplines your flesh to receive. The end of every chastisement is a receiving, not a judgment. The end of every chastisement is a glory of increase, not a cessation of things. That's how God has made life to be. It's how he has ordained your story to be. Hallelujah, glory to God. Glory to God. But when we're going through chastisement, when we're going through the tests, when we're going through the trials, when we have fallen and many things have gotten on us, sometimes the chastisement of God and his children, when you observe it from afar, it sort of starts to make even the heathen appear righteous. It sometimes even justifies the heathen into righteousness. It could appear. Because look at the point where the children of Israel have fallen. And now they're in the hands of men who have no relationship with God. But yet God has let them in that space for chastisement. And they could look or appear to those men that they are the fallen. And the men above them, the heathen above them, are the righteous. When we go through our times of testation, even the people who are wrong can appear to be right. When you're going through those days when God is disciplining you, people can observe you and even judge your destiny and think that that is the end of your story. It is possible, have seen by life, to appear so defeated for a moment, yet you are in the most truly loved moment with God. But yet, to the world that is fallen, to the world that does not know God, you can appear 
to be the most rejected, the most fallen thing. But God has promised that even if you're going through that fire, he says, when you go through that fire, he says, I will be with you. He says, when you go through the waters, I will be with you. He's not the God who abandons you in your chastisement. No. He's the God who goes with you in that fire. He's the God who goes with you in those waters. He's the God who is with you even in those test stations. Yes, the devil is dealing with the man. He knows that. But he's the God who's just not going to watch you. No, he's the God who wants to be with you in that. That every suffering that you go through, he's weeping with you. He is with you through. That is the mind of God. You should never forget that. That even though you're in trouble right now, you're watching me. It could be a financial trouble. It could be a marriage trouble. It could be a career trouble. Relationship trouble. Whichever trouble you're in. I want you to know, even if you are responsible for that trouble, but you are a child of God, I want you to know that he is with you even in that trouble. And in his dealings, he will look to chastising you, but he will surely discipline you to receive the place and space that he has ordained you for an inheritance. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Sometimes when we go through stuff, we're tempted to even think that God has left us. There's somebody watching me, you're listening. Sometimes you think, I feel God has abandoned me. I don't think this will ever change. I don't think uh, circumstances will ever change. It can happen when you're going through the chastisement of the Spirit. It is possible to go through the tempest storm, yet truly in the most sanctifying graces of God. Most sanctifying graces of God. So what the world sees is, oh, these are storms. Oh, this man or woman is going to sink. Yet what God sees, you are in the center of sanctifying grace. He's dealing with you. He has an end in line. He sees the destiny and where it's going to end with you. But the world will not see that because they do not know the heart of the Father. It's possible to be exposed to all men as of all men most fallen, yet in the most perfect and divine will of God concerning your life. It's very possible. But hey, what does the world know? Remember the story of how, you know, the Apostle Paul is being taken in Rome. The scriptures tell us they get into a ship and, you know, they get shipwrecked and they survive narrowly. He crosses over to the island of Malta and as he's starting a fire, a viper comes from the fire and stings him. And the people that were around, the Bible says when they saw the venomous beast, they said among themselves, this man is a murderer. He has escaped the sea. The Bible says, yet vengeance suffereth not him to live. It has found him on the dry ground. But whether it was a serpent, a viper on him, whether it was the sinking in the sea, whether it was the judgments that were on his life as according to the Roman law, Paul was in the perfect will of God. He was in the most perfect will of God. So the chastisements of God are interesting. They're not even only there on our lives only because we've fallen. Some chastisements come in our lives because they seek to perfect ourselves or us to the maturity that God so desires us to run the race and course that we must run. Sometimes it's not that we've even fallen or sinned or done anything wrong. Somebody can come in your life and speak evil about you for 10, 20 years and you ask yourself, God, why don't you just kill this fellow? That's the kind of you thinking. But God is saying, uh-uh. Let them speak whatever they're speaking. What the world will take is what that person will speak about you against you. But what I have with you, I am chastising you. I am teaching you to carry a certain heart, a certain mind. And you hear the Spirit of God silencing you. It tells you, uh-uh, don't say anything against them. You know, you stand next to them and they draw themselves away from you. Because you're the scum, you're shameful. And some of those things you could be responsible for. And some you might never be responsible for. And in some of those things, there are people you will never convince. 
Because they don't want to understand you. They have a fear in understanding you. But God understands you. God knows you. So here's my message. It doesn't matter whether you are in trouble innocently or that you are in trouble because of your own doing. And of course, which is a problem because you shouldn't be in trouble because of your own doing. But regardless of all that, I have good news for you. That everything that you have and have been given in Christ Jesus stays steadfast and available for you at your turning. Whether it was a reason of ignorance, immaturity, rebellion, no matter whatever was happening in your time, in your life at that particular time. Whether it was sheer innocence, and the devil chose to malign you and defame you. It doesn't matter what. The point is that your inheritance never leaves. It is steadfast. It's available. God is waiting for whatever is disturbing you to end. And when it does, he will surely restore you. There is nothing God has ordained for you that has left you. There is nothing God has given you that he has taken back from you. It is still available. All he's looking for is that after having all readiness to revenge against all disobedience when your obedience is coming. But everything that you have in Christ Jesus, whether in your most fallen sense as a believer or in your most righteous position as a believer, is still available both to the circumcised and the uncircumcised through faith. Hallelujah, glory to God. In other words, you should never let circumstances, whether in your own doing or not, define your destiny. You can begin from here and write another story. It does not matter how bad it has been. You can start from today and write another story of your life. And God has a way of bringing too much glory in your life that your past will not matter one day. It is possible by God. This is the power to begin again. I'm talking about a God who can rebuild you from nothing. Who can find you at your most fallen and broken spaces and rebuild you from nothing while your enemies are watching. So it's possible to go through all of these kinds of things. Israel went through these things. People go through these things every day. But the question is, can I rebuild again after all that I've done? Can I straighten up again after all the crookedness on my life? Can I live right after all the wickedness? I have destroyed people. Some people will say, I've done things to so and so. I don't even know whether God will ever forgive. I've done things to people. Even if I ask God, I would not forgive myself. No, that's you thinking in your human nature. God still has plans for you. To make you prosper and not to harm you. Your inheritance stays sure in spite of your weakness. And at your turning, at the chastisement, at the full term of God dealing with you, you will stand again with him and you will still say, healing was available and is available for you. Deliverance was available and is available for you. Breakthrough was available and is available for you. Greatness is available, was available for you. Increase was available, is available for you. Breakthrough is available, was available for you. And you can begin from anywhere. There is nothing impossible with God. I'm talking about a God, I repeat. Who can rebuild you from nothing? Who can resuscitate anything dead, rejuvenate anything old? Who can give life a youthfulness to something that has worked to its end? And he rebuilds that story. And one day people look at you and it's as though it never happened in the first place. It is possible. It is possible. Because he's jealous when it comes to what he has given you. He does not want to get to a point where you cannot get to what he has given you because of your own weakness. No, he can deal with you all he wants. But he has to get you to the place where you can still say, God, now I understand it. He say, no, your healing is still available. 
your restoration is still available. Some people think, oh, it's too late. I'm so old. How can I, you know, what can I do in this last? No, 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 no. That's all nonsense. What does God need? How long does he need? Look at this Jesus Christ, the man that we represent for the hour. This man's ministry was three years. One, two, three. But it's on that platform that the church of Jesus Christ is standing. There are men who have served for 70 years in the gospel, 60 years in the gospel, 50 years in the gospel, 30 years in the gospel. But this man had only three years with God's mandate and agenda. And look at what he has done to the world. Look at how many souls come to the saving knowledge of that man every day. Look at what the world has become because one man submitted himself to the will of the Father. We cannot tell what happened in the last 30 years before. All we know is that he works strong, you know, in favor, in wisdom, in stature. Yeah, we know all that. But we know those three years that these were the defining matter concerning the man's life. And before we know it, up to today, we're still talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He abides in us all. His ministry has continued without him in the flesh because he yielded to the will and purposes of God 100%. God does not need 20 years to make you. It's in your human understanding. God does not need 30 years to make you. It's in your human understanding. God does not need 60 years to give you a successful ministry. He doesn't need 70 years to give you, you know, a successful business. He doesn't need 20 years to give you a successful He doesn't need that. Time and chance is available for everybody who believes. And at that place when a man is inspired to believe, compelled to submit entirely to the will of God, regardless of that man's past, God can change everything and make you begin again. And people can look at your end and they cannot tell whether there was even any fault with you in the first place. That is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the God we serve. So we see him so jealous. And why is he jealous? Because... The enemies of Israel have gone to a point because they see Israel in its most fallen state. They think they can take over the inheritance that God has ordained for them. And he says, uh-uh. You can afflict them all you want. You can take their clothes and shoes. You can take over their houses. But what you can't do is take away what I gave them for an inheritance. Because these are people for a covenant. In Micah, the seventh chapter, the eighth verse, it says, Rejoice not against me. Oh, my enemy. He says, when I fall, okay, I shall rise. He says, when I fall, I shall rise. A child of God never sinks. He will never sink. It doesn't matter how many mistakes we've made. There is a place in us that is in God that can rebuild you again. That is why the warning is to our enemies. That is why the warning is to the devil and his cohorts. That's why the warning is to those that carry spirits of wickedness in high places. The warning is to those who speak evil about you and against you. The warning is to those who speak, regardless of whether they are right or wrong. The Bible has said, let's just say you are the wrong one and you have truly fallen. He has said, rejoice not against me, my enemies, for when I fall, I shall rise again. There is a point where God intends to bring us up again. The Bible says, who are you to judge another man's servant? Who are you? He's asking. Do you think that your position of a bishop, apostle, pastor, prophet, evangelist, man of God is enough for you to judge a woman of God or a man of God? No. He says, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? And that Bible says, to his own master, the Bible says, he standeth and fails. Yeah, the Bible says, he shall be holding up. If you read that from the Amplified, it says, Who are you, O who pass judgment and censor another man's household servant? He says, It is before his own master that he stands and falls. And listen to God's mind. The Bible says, He shall stand and be upheld. For the master, the Lord, is mighty to support. 
put him and make him stand. In other words, every orata laboza, every intention for every child of God that you are spiting at, you're backbiting, you're speaking evil about, you're blackmailing. Even in the most fallen nature, there is a mind with the master to make that person stand. And not only to make him stand, but to uphold him with his own power, support him with his own might, so that man will stand the end of every believer, even in the most fallen state, is to stand one day. And they always stand. They always stand. That's the way of God. They always stand. They always stand. Praise God, hallelujah. They always stand. And he continues to say, When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light to me. You see? Because he never leaves that man. He never leaves that believer. Yes, she's in darkness. But even in that darkness, if she is or he is a man of a covenant, God will come and give light there. And be his light or her light in that darkness. And the next verse says, And I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I've sinned against him until he plead my cause. See, the man has sinned against God, but God is pleading that man's cause to execute judgment for the man, not against the man. For the man, not against the man. And the next line says, he will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. Then she, that is my enemy, shall see it and the shame shall cover her which said unto me, where is the Lord thy God? My eyes shall behold her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire. Listen, see, you can speak evil or think evil of a fallen brother or sister. But have you ever asked yourself what God's plan for that individual is? And look at how he says that the eyes of your enemy shall see you go up. And there is nothing that, that person can do. The same people that judged you in your most straight times, they will see you go up and there is nothing in the world they can do. It has come to my sense, both spiritual and physical, that if somebody is in a covenant with God, you don't write them off. God has a way of rebuilding even the most broken things. The Bible says he's the saving strength of his anointing. And how God lifts up this person in a time when he has positioned you to see them rise. To see her rise. And then tell you, watch. This is the one you thought would not rise up. This is the one you thought would not make it. This is the one you thought would not have their own job and their own house and their own ministry. This is the one you assumed that they were no more. And God has dealt. God has dealt. Because that's the heart of God. You cannot make God be what is not. That's simply the heart of God. Now, if we will skip uh, to the verses 24, again in Ezekiel 36. These are poor fallen. God has judged them. They are, you know, in some sort of uh, chastisement. The enemies are boasting. God is sending a prophet. He's telling him, go prophesy on those people. And look at what God does. God promises that I will take you from among the heathen. These are men that are fallen. He's prophesying on them even when they are not yet restored. The word of God is coming to them to stir their hearts to repentance. Even when they still don't get it. You see, he has sent the prophet because he only works by the word. It's the law of beginnings. In the beginning, you know, the world was without form. It was void. The spirit of the Lord was hovering over the earth. And God said, let there be. The law of beginnings comes with the word. That critical word that is commanded in the spirit realm to change your circumstance irrespective of your attention. That's the law of beginnings. Everything was formed by the word. The Bible says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Everything begins with the word. Some of you are going through things and you think, oh, you know, I don't know. No, no, no. All you need is a particular word. And for all of you watching me today, your word is this. I am speaking from God. He's speaking something in somebody's life. I don't know whether it's your business that had stalled, it's your relationship that has stalled, it's your career, your education that has stalled, your body is at a stall. I don't know what is happening in your life. 
as of whether you are responsible in your ignorance or your deliberate mind, as of whether it's not even your doing, wherever you are, I have good news for you. That all you need is the word to kickstart this redemption. So you see, at that time, the enemies of Israel are triumphant. They're victorious. The wealth is theirs. The provisions are theirs. The external prosperity is with them. The children of Israel at that particular point, externally, have none to show. They are beaten. They are bruised. They are thumped. They have nothing to them. But you see, by God, they are his beloved. And they are the advantaged ones because they still have a relationship with God. And so he says, look, I'll take you from among the heathen. Now there's a prophet speaking. God is speaking what he's going to do in spite of the foolishness. And he says, and gather you out of all the countries and I will bring you into your own land. And he says, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. This is God promising. And he says in the next verse, 26, a new heart will I also give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. I want you to underline that, cause you. You went wherever you wanted. You went wayward and crazy. You were forward in your life. But this thing that I'm doing intends not only to put my spirit in you, but I want to give a power to you that will cause you to walk in my statutes. In other words, I intend not only to get you out of that mire, I also intend to put something in you, to give an instruction in you, to release a certain power and grace in you that will cause you to walk the right way so you don't go back to where you came from. That's the mind of the spirit. That is the way of God. And I want you to see what God is doing. I want your eyes to zoom out from just the small things that lack rent and fees. And zoom out to the bigger picture of how God deals with humanity. And then he continues to say, You shall keep my judgments and do them. This is now not him commanding. This is him giving the certainty of things. Because of the law that he has appropriated in your spirit to obey God. Now some people don't see that this is the New Testament story. That's why when Peter speaks of how we are sanctified unto obedience, it's more than just please obey God. No. There's a law at work within us, the law of the life-giving spirit in Christ Jesus that sanctifies us unto obedience. There's something in us that is working in our lives. In fact, obedience for the new creation is not a work. It's not the individual work. It is the underlying faith in the God that works in that individual, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So he says we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. We are sanctified through the spirit by the sprinkling of the blood and to obedience. We are sanctified and to obedience. He has put a law in you that should cause you not to go back in what you have fallen into. Because his grace and peace daily is multiplied in you through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That law is within us. No person who understands the new birth would not appreciate or is not fully yielded to the spirit of grace that works in you. He says, walk out your salvation in fear and in trembling. He says, but it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So there's something in us. There's a person in us willing to do right. There's somebody and something in us willing to do right. And that's the man which is begotten in God, the new creation, the spirit man in you. He says he's an enemy to the flesh and the flesh is an enemy to the spirit. So the mistake we have in the church is we look at the weaknesses of men in the flesh and take that for an imperfection of the same men in the spirit. No. No. The Bible says, though our outward man perish because of sin, but our inward man, the Bible says, is renewed daily by the spirit of God. 
There's a difference between these two. Otherwise, how do you receive the strength to kill the man of the flesh if the man inside you is worse or of the same level with the man of the flesh? That's how we war. That's where our true war is. The Romans says, if you buy the spirit or if you through the spirit, the Bible says, kill the transactions of the body, you shall live. So where does the ability of the man of the spirit come from to kill the transactions of the body? It's because he's holy, he's sanctified, he's been created in true holiness and righteousness. Because to him, holiness is not a work. Holiness is a nature of the new birth. That's what the Bible speaks of, you know, holiness, the general word, and true holiness. The Bible says you've put on the new man, which has been renewed. He's been birthed. He's been immersed in true holiness and righteousness. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's the experience of the new birth. It's the experience of the new birth. So, we see God putting a new spirit in them, taking away the stony heart of flesh, giving them a new heart, putting a new spirit, causing them to walk in his statutes, for them to keep his judgments. And he says, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I shall be your God. And 29 says, and I will also save you from all your uncleanliness, and I will call for the corn and I will increase it, and I will lay no famine upon you, and I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field, that you shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. In other words, I intend to deal with you spiritually. And after dealing with you spiritually, dealing with your moral life, dealing with your faith life, dealing with your understanding and revelation life, if I deal with your spiritual, then I will get to the physical. I will get to the physical. God, when he comes to the New Testament, he doesn't intend to give you a car without dealing with your character. No. He wants to, yes, give you that car, but he also wants to deal with your character. It's important that you go to heaven. It's important that you live a righteous life in Christ Jesus. It's important that you are aligned to purpose and cause. It's important to God. It's important to God. Unfortunately, in our days, the testimony is the house and the car. Not the place where we can hear God. Not the place where we are givers toward God. Not the place where we are servants of God. Not the place where we are winning souls. The testimony is the car, the house. But that is changing in the mighty name of Jesus. So we see God deal with them. And in the 33rd verse, the Bible says, That saith the Lord God, In that day I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, and I will cause you to dwell, listen, in the cities and the west shall be builded. The west shall be builded. If you read that from the Amplified Version, he says, in that day, I will cleanse you from all your iniquities and I will also cause Israel's cities to be inhabited and the west places shall be rebuilt. He's saying, I will rebuild you. That's my mind. That's my name. That's my understanding. That's the greatness of my glory, the intention of my definitive plan. And it says in the next verse, And the desolate land shall be tilled that which had laid desolate in the sight of all who passed by. And they shall say, This land that was desolate, not you, they, people who are watching will say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the west and desolate and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. If you go back in the verses earlier, you will see that that was the very land that used to swallow men, destroy them to swallowing them up. The same land God is saying, uh-uh, in the place where you were swallowed, in the place where you were consumed, in the place where you were destroyed. He says, I want to now rebuild those places, the very desolate, the places where they used to pass by and say, uh-uh, that ministry will never come back again. That marriage will never be built again her children will never be restored that career is gone she will never get money that man will never get a wife that woman will never get a husband again that guy will never be rebuilt again he's gone beyond repair god is saying they shall say to the very land that was desolate that it has become like the garden of eden and the western desolate and ruined cities shall be fortified and inhabited and he says and then the nations that are left around you and about you shall know that i the lord have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I love it that they will say, 
I love it that all the nations around you, God wants to rebuild you to a place where you won't need to speak about it to your enemies. No, he will make it so, so abroad. He will expand the testimony of that thing. He will rise you to a place where they must see you. They must see you. And when they do, they will say, ah, oh, it's beautiful when you're not the one saying, oh, I have money. It's beautiful when they look at you and say, that woman has money. That man has been rebuilt. Her ministry has been restored. His marriage has been restored. His career is now upward and upward. God is saying, I will rebuild those desolate places. 37 says, thus said the Lord God, for also will I let the house of Israel inquire of me to do it for them. I'll increase their men like the flock of holy things for sacrifice, like the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn appointed feast. So shall the west cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know and understand and realize that I'm the Lord God, the sovereign ruler, who calls forth loyalty and obedience in service. I will do it. I'll rebuild you. If this sermon is not important to you now, it one day will be. But when you remember this, remember that he will rebuild you. He can rebuild you. He is able to rebuild. He's the God who rebuilds. He rebuilds. I want to pray with someone. Perhaps you're listening to me right now. And what you're going through seems like you are sinking. You're sinking in debt. Could be your doing. Could be not your doing. I don't know. You're sinking. In health, could be you're doing, you smoke those cigarettes and now you're dealing with lung cancer. Could be not you're doing, you sat next to those that were smoking and you inhaled it, but you're a believer. You are a child of God. God wants to rebuild your body. God wants to rebuild your lungs. God wants to rebuild your heart. There's a marriage that has fallen. You were sent divorce papers. God can rebuild that marriage again. God can rebuild your child who is on drugs again. God can rebuild your business that has sunk in this COVID season. I want to pray with somebody who can dare to believe God for the impossible. Who can dare to believe God? He is the God that rebuilds desolate places and desolate things. He can do it and he's going to do it for you. Again, he will rebuild you. Your inheritance is steadfast and it stands sure. It's still available for you in God. Somebody, you're going to receive your health back. Diabetes is healing. Hypertension is healing. He can rebuild you again. He can rebuild whatever organ the devil has damaged. He can rebuild a new, you know, blood system. He can rebuild a new pancreas. He can rebuild a new kidney. He can rebuild it in the mighty name of Jesus. Raise your voice right now wherever you want. Speak to God. Shatala broko tala mandoro bo zala baka tala ba yere bo sara lele bo rata la ba ko sara lele bo sara rara ba zire bro shaka tala mandara ba zaba ko sara rara rara ba bro zire ma ko sala mandoro bro zaka tala pa ye kambo rubo zile bo shika tala branda la hosa ropo zile pa ya kanda raba zebo ko shetelima. Mozere broko prakatala mandara baso lebaha. Jatala brozolomonde rekeseleba. Ribozibo ko salamando roboza. Rika zalama ko satalaba yerebo. Ayibo jalalama ye. I speak to your ministry if you're a minister. I know that your ministry could be broken right now because of either of COVID or other, other reasons. But I declare and I declare that God rebuilds your ministry. God rebuilds your marriage, you man or woman. God rebuilds your finances. God rebuilds your business. God rebuilds your education. God rebuilds your eyes. 
in the mighty name of Jesus. God rebuilds your hearing. God rebuilds your service. There's somebody you've been struggling to hear God again. For a long time you fell off and you could not hear the voice of God for a long time. He's rebuilding that relationship with you in the mighty name of Jesus. And you're going to hear him more than ever before. I believe tonight that God is rebuilding all broken things. He's rebuilding all the desolate things. He's rebuilding all the, sh the shambles. He's rebuilding everything that was running out of line for you. I decree and I declare that this time mark this date on your calendar as God beginning a new chapter in your life and you shall not be disappointed in the mighty name of Jesus. Now I want to pray for those of you that want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you say you know what I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Everything I've spoken is for people and a covenant. But you can enter that covenant today. You don't need to wait for tomorrow because I don't know what's going to happen to you next week or next year. But I'm certain what just happened because God allowed you to tune in tonight. You will repeat these words after me. Say it from your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Today, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.